At some point, they started calling it the Raytheon Aircraft Company 1900D. Doesn't quite flow off the tongue. Call it a Beach 1900 instead. That's what they were named when they came off the assembly line. Before that, it was called a King Air. Such is the winding path of aviation. Things are built, companies go bankrupt, other companies buy them. The good airplanes have a production run before slowly being relegated either by use or neglect to dry storage in a desert somewhere. Great airplanes never die. They evolve. Designing an aircraft from scratch is an expensive business. When you hit an in-demand market on the head, you make every iteration of it that you can imagine. You stretch the cabin, throw some strakes and ventral fins on it to keep it from misbehaving too badly, and you rebrand it for some other operation. Boeing did it with the 737. Airbus did it with the A320. And Beechcraft did it with the King Air before Raytheon bought them. They dumped 19 seats in it for regional use and were branded at the 1900. They sold a few corporate copies as well. It's ugly as sin. It's also an utter workhorse. Every pilot who has flown one falls a little in love with it, present company included. It's easier, for our sake here, to pretend the aircraft in question was a King Air instead of a 1900. It's not really a lie. If you have a problem with it, take it up with the Sobo. My hands are tied. If you've ever been on a 1900, you know that 19 seats in that cabin are an economy squeeze. Corporate configuration typically means less seats, more room with leather and brushed walnut. If you were a coal miner being transported to Black Mesa in 2008, you were lucky to get a seat belt. You were also soon to get pushed out of a job. Coal's a dying market. On board were 18 passengers plus two crew members. Both the captain and the first officer had over 5,000 hours of total time. The captain had 2,700 hours in the 1900. The first officer had 4,200. The thing was powered by two Pratt & Whitney PT6A turbines making 1,279 horsepower each. Some people look at a prop and think of Charles Lindbergh, but these things are serious speed machines. It's only when compared to a jet that they seem slow. It was a pure up and down flight. Departure at 0703, climb to 17,000 feet, descend at 0724, flaps extended four minutes later while passing through 10,000 feet. That's a little high on most approaches for flaps, but Peabody, Bernard Field, and Cayenta, Arizona is 6,600 feet above sea level. It was also, on this day, a bit of a mess. Fog had knocked visibility down to one half mile. There was a broken layer of clouds 100 feet above the runway, which was contaminated by slush. Winds were nine knots out of the south. They were flying an RNAV GPS approach to runway two. If you're quick at math, that means that they were taking a tailwind near the 10 knot limit for the 1900 into a slush covered runway. The NTSB set aside an entire page of the final report to detail 30 minutes worth of weather segmented in five minute increments. They don't say much about the decision to land with the tailwind, but it appears to have been on their mind. The minimum visibility for the straight in approach was one mile. The minimum descent altitude, MDA, was 6860 feet mean sea level. That's 329 feet above the ground. In a filing to the FAA following the crash, the operator reported that 2 to 3 inches of slush were on the runway, which is an awful lot. Airline operators will generally pull the pin on anything over 3 quarters of an inch of wet contamination. Hydroplaning is bad in any machine, but at 120 knots and something that is ungainly on the ground to begin with, it's downright dangerous. If you're a glass half full type, the friction of all that slush will help you to slow down. When you depart the end of the runway, it probably won't be too fast. The runway was equipped with an assortment of approach lights that are pilot operated via three to seven clicks over the radio. These lights assist orientation to the degree that the FAA allows pilots to descend below minimum altitudes with only the flashers in sight. The only caveat is that pilots must see the runway in order to descend the last 100 feet. Per regulation, this final descent must be made at a normal rate, which is defined as no more than 1,000 feet per minute to land within the touchdown zone. Say what you will about the captain, but he had good airspeed control. Data for both approaches showed the aircraft reaching 6,500 feet pressure altitude at 112 knots on the button both times. The key word here is both approaches. The first one resulted in a go around. There was a cockpit voice recorder aboard the commuter aircraft, but the NTSB did not release it in a public docket. They quoted a few lines in the final report, but none of them covered the reason for the initial go around. It's not too hard to sort out though. The first officer stated during cruise that he hoped that the approach lights were working. They had not been working the previous day on a flight that he had operated. 
During both approaches, the aircraft leveled off briefly at 6,800 feet. This indicated that the crew did not see either the runway or the approach lights at the minimum altitude, otherwise they would have continued their descent. On the first approach, the aircraft remained at 6,800 feet for a minute before it descended to an altitude of 6,499 feet, which is actually a bit below the field elevation. The NTSB does not explain this discrepancy, but it most likely was a result of a miscalibrated static port feeding altitude information to the aircraft's flight data recorder. Likely, the aircraft descended to around 100 feet above touchdown zone elevation prior to executing a missed approach. The captain applied power, initiated a climb, and retracted the flaps. They leveled off at 10,000 feet. Five minutes passed before they began descending again. Once again, the aircraft leveled off at 6,800 feet, but this time the captain only waited 30 seconds prior to descending below the minimum descent altitude for the approach. Three seconds prior to this, the first officer had stated, There's a runway right below you. In between the first and second approach, the crew obtained an updated weather briefing over the radio. Visibility was reported as one half mile in snow with a ceiling of 200 feet. Both values were below the minimums required for the GPS approach. The crew had every reason to suspect that they would not have the runway in sight when they reached the minimum altitude. By this point, they knew for a fact that they wouldn't have the approach lights in sight either. Following the go-around from the first approach, the first officer stated, I didn't see any lights on. I clicked them three separate times. There's no indication that they had any of the required visual elements in sight when they descended below minimums during the first approach. Given the details in the final accident report, it appears as though they had already overflown the runway and were significantly past the missed approach point when they began their descent below minimums. A good guess is that they popped out of a broken cloud layer and saw the ground. Descending below minimums without any visual reference altogether would be an abnormally bold move. There is something else. While leveling off at the MDA of 6,800 feet during both approaches, the autopilot was disengaged. The NTSB does not provide a reason for this, but good money is that the captain wanted to milk the final 40 feet to the minimum altitude of 6860. With the autopilot on, the aircraft would have leveled at 6900 feet. This is because the altitude selector on the Beach 1900 is selectable in only 100 foot increments. Psychology is a hell of a thing. Pilots have the tendency to be old school when it comes to the inner workings of the mind. At 140 knots, 50 feet off the deck, and gusting winds and blowing snow, it doesn't seem like the touchy-filly stuff is going to do you much good. you got to be a little arrogant to strap an aircraft on and blast off into the heavens to begin with. But muck around and accident reports long enough, and you'll eventually be forced to acknowledge the importance of mindset. If you are kicking off the autopilot in the hopes that an extra 40 feet of altitude will salvage an approach, you are priming yourself to be fixated on completing the mission no matter the cost. This isn't to say that it shouldn't never be done, you just need to realize the dangers when you're doing it. Hand flying an aircraft occupies a good bit of attention. This reduces the residual amount of mental capacity available for good decision making. This makes decisions more reflexive and less thoughtful, quicker but not as precise. One of the great differentiators of aeronautical decision making is that it often occurs in a stupendously time compressed environment. Sometimes all a pilot has is a few seconds to choose their next move. Being impulsive is a bad thing, but sometimes it's unavoidable. In any complex environment, the error rate increases inversely with the amount of time available to make a decision. The antidote to this is operational rigidity. When you break the rules in aviation, sometimes you die. Sometimes you end up in a hostile interview with the NTSB. Most of the time you get away with it. It's a lot like life. The first officer informed the captain that the runway was in sight directly beneath them. He molded over for three seconds before chopping the power and diving for the tarmac. He most likely measured the capabilities of the aircraft with his personal level of skills and determined that he could make the runway with enough room to stop. It may be outside of the first third of the runway, which by definition is a touchdown zone, but the 1900 doesn't require an awful lot of blacktop to come to a stop. He was right. Everything went fine until they were on the ground. His impulse hadn't lied to him, but it also wasn't informed by the effects of a tailwind on top of a contaminated runway. The regulations are great at spoiling a party, but occasionally they'll keep you from catastrophe. The aircraft landed halfway down the 7,500-foot runway. The captain selected reverse immediately and applied the brakes. The deceleration was sluggish. The final airspeed indication as the aircraft departed the runway was 31 knots. 
At nine knots of tailwind and the minimum ground speed when the 1900 departed the runway was 40 knots. Everyone survived, but five of the miners were injured, two of them seriously. The landing gear collapsed in the dirt at the end of the runway. It knocked over an airport perimeter fence and slid to a stop across rough terrain. The damage was significant. The pilots, as they should, took the blame for it. An impulsive decision egged on by a comrade. An accurate assessment of skills ignorant of conditions. The specter of inconvenience overcoming an ingrained preference for regulatory compliance. The worst possible response is to focus on the crew's obvious errors, dismissing it as the outcome of an idiot. If you think it can never happen to you, you haven't spent much time in the accident database. If you know it could happen to you, you're one large step towards ensuring that it won't. Welcome to aviation.